Hey, folks, Zach Osterman here, Mike Nislick there, Wilmington Herald Times, Indianapolis Star, uh, Indiana 56, Nebraska 7. Um, you know, Mike, I think we've talked in the last couple of wins about reframing expectations around this team, around this this season. I feel like you can only really have one expectation at this point, which is that until they prove otherwise, and they might at some point, you know, they might next week against Washington, who knows. But until Indiana proves otherwise, you've got to treat this like a Big Ten contender, which means you've got to treat this like a playoff contender because that is the kind of football Indiana's playing. Yeah, I think the headline I put on my story today was Indiana is one of the best teams in college football. I mean, that's really, that's, it's that simple. I mean, a blowout like this against, you know, I think there was two discussions was, is India coming into this game, is Indiana's offense for real? And how good is Nebraska's defense? We learned, <laughs> well, <laughs> Kurt I, I, had some thoughts. I think, I think we know. Kurt uh, had some thoughts. I, I think we know. Um, uh, maybe Nebraska's defense wasn't as good as everyone. Turning kind of, in live from Chalubis. <laughs> <laughs> we're yeah. live. I thought we were live at Chalubis. But... Zach's favorite joke. Um, but no, I think, you know, you know, there'll be questions now about Nebraska's defense. But look, this was a just out and out three phase dominance. They out coached them. They played better. They ran all over them against a team historically that's had not just this year, but historically has held teams on the ground to. Um, you know, very little production. Uh, the first team this season to rush for 200 against Nebraska. It's only the second team since, and suddenly his name has gone out of my head. I just had it, but Nebraska's defense coordinator has been there for two years now. This is only the second team to rush for 200 against Nebraska since he got so that's there. What, I mean, that's the, the other, reputation. The other was Michigan, and that's, I mean, Michigan last year, yeah. national champion Michigan last year. And that then was the uh, special teams. And then, obviously, offensively, I think we knew that there was a gap there. But then, you know, I think the only shadow that hangs over this game is Curtis's work, Curtis Rourke's injuries. We'll talk about that. But the backup quarterback comes in, and the defense goes crazy, forces four turnovers, and the offense scores. I think every time they had the ball after a turnover. So I mean, like, yeah. what's the? I mean, what can you? I mean, I did I, love. I that asked was you my favorite. Like James Evans went out to punt in the fourth yeah, quarter. Does, and like, does he remember how? No, my favorite part of the post game press conference was. Uh, Kirsten Day does a brief intro. And he's like, we did drop a pass. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And that was like, I mean, yeah, I guess that's that's the... the uh, I, I thought something that was interesting. I, I thought Indiana surprised itself a little bit today. Like, I think, like, like and Kirsten Nettie is always going to be like, no complacency, guard against it, it's my job. But, like, for example, we talked to Tyson Lawton, um, who had, he finished with eight carries for 64 yards and a touchdown. And um, obviously, he's you know alongside Justice Ellison, he's been Indiana's kind of main half of Indiana's main running back rotation this year. And he said we thought the holes would be tight today. We thought you know that defensive line, that defensive front, we had a ton of respect for him. We thought it was going to be difficult, and he basically just said like they might have been the widest holes I've been running through all year. And you know, however you kind of want to take this, like the direction, like I mean, they held Nebraska to. 2.4 rushing yards. They turned. They, they weren't a good rushing team. They, they, no, but they uh, but, but they the, dominated line of scrimmage, well, and that led to Rayola just completely. Was he, was, there, he, was, he was. He was. He was. He was. Yes, he was completely rattled. He threw three picks, which is as many as he'd thrown all season coming into this game. Um, you know, you talk about the uh, basically the opposite of rattled. Taven Jackson comes in after Curtis Rourke gets hurt, and obviously Indiana doesn't need a ton from him because they're already up three but scores. They try, I mean, that throw to the corner. I mean, you don't make that throw. I mean, yeah, you don't, you don't attempt that throw. And, that having some and also, seven of eight for ninety-one yards and two touchdowns against a Big Ten defense is Completed like his first six. Points. Yeah, I mean, like that's you know, there's just you have just Urban Meyer before this game made a really big deal whenever anybody asked him to talk about it about how well coached he thought Indiana was, and you watch a game like this, and you see the way. You know, second teamers play. You see, you have to make a quarterback change in the way that quarterback plays. You see how, you know, the extent to which it, it felt like this defense never really kind of gave up on the idea that, like, no matter what the score is, we're not going to stop. Like, it, it's really hard to look at this team and not wonder. If, certainly, you say it's one of the best teams in, in the country. It is almost certainly one of the best coached teams in the country. Like, the job that, that Kurt Signetti and his staff have done taking a team that was turned over by more than half – out of the last season's roster. And yes, they got a lot of veteran transfers, but like they had to go get those. They had to identify those players. Then they had to get them. Then they had to put, you know, mesh the whole thing together in just one off season. And listen, I don't know where this ends for Indiana. I, I, I can't tell you, and I'm not going to make any promises, but uh, I mean, I, I just like, I grew up in the South. I know what good football looks like. This, you also know bad football. 
yeah, yeah. And um, this this is. But instead of going big picture yet, I, I think the kind of the key stretch of the game for me, uh, Kirk Signetti said it was the interception, the interception in the second half. I thought it was actually the, the early in the game, uh, and Justice Ellison talked about this. First thing was he said getting a rushing touchdown and getting rushing yeah. yards and having a big gain on that first drive thought was really important. This team had a lot of rushing touchdown all year. Um, and there was a lot of talk about that, what they could do. He's like, I really thought if we could score that, like right off the bat and get that punch that in, that that would sort of open everything up. And, and it did, I think. In well, I don't know if you were there yet when he talked about that and he said basically – when we did that, I thought so it was we, 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 we might we might just be able to yeah. roll them. And then the second one was Jalen Walker's forced fumble because uh, Kirsten and I took a couple gambles early. He went for it on fourth down on both their first possessions. We talked about, kind of debated the merits of those decisions. Um, the second one didn't work out. But Kirsch work was sacked. Gave Nebraska a really good field position when they could have gone up 10 nothing. But part of, I think, the equation is I have faith in my defense that we're going to make the play and stop mm -hmm. them. They yeah. stopped Nebraska on a fourth down. Jalen Walker punches out the ball. And that, I mean, really is bulky. <laughs> I mean, really, that was not, yeah. you know, they just kind of uh, had their way with it afterward. And I think you see the coaches, coaching staff's confidence in the players and the players stepping up for the coaches. And I think you saw that then what Kurt was talking about in the second half where, you know, he's mentioned like they didn't go for the jugular in certain games. Man, that they did it today with those four forced turnovers in the second half yeah. and offensively sort of doing it. So I think, you know, before the game kind of got, you know, crazy in the second half for Indiana, I thought those kind of things stood out early where there were a couple moments where maybe this game doesn't look like exactly like it did, where it's, a, you know, one of the biggest wins in a program history against a big time opponent. Well, and I think it's a reflection. I mean, like, this would have been a very easy week to get distracted. You're coming off the bye week. You've spent a lot of the bye week. Obviously, you know, coaches have been recruiting and things, but there's also Blue a lot. Is handing out free beer, <laughs> free dragon free, flies. Free floppies. Uh, that's, that's the floppy Sammies. Um, the, the, you've got, like, your quarterback on the Heisman podcast. Didn't know they had a Heisman podcast, but apparently he was on it. You've got Kurt Signetti doing a media tour. National media is in town to write about Indiana, you know, the last two, three weeks. you got big noon kickoff here. There are a ton of rumors about ESPN game day, I think. By the way, before anybody asks, I, I assume we would probably find out about that sometime Saturday night. I think that is normally when they probably tend to announce. Probably wait to see what Brett Vanderbilt probably does. Maybe. I mean, they, if, if, if this was their first choice, then there's really no reason to wait. But we'll see. I would expect to find out sometime Saturday, one way or the other. I just – like, I think they announce – on Saturday, where they are going the next Saturday. Um, but there was a lot of reason to be distracted. Like there was, you know, I mean, I had multiple friends, like other media colleagues who are obviously just Indiana agnostic, but they know I cover IU football. We talk about it sometimes. Who said like, is this, is this the kind of like the train off the tracks game where basically they're just, they've had too much success. They get a little too full of it. They're playing a decent team. They get distracted. And the answer was so emphatically no that the train turned into a jumbo jet and is now flying across the Pacific Ocean. I like it, it, I mean, like I don't it, really it's, think that analogy worked in any way. Shape well, but but, I, but when, yeah, it was it was like the transportation age uh, evolving I, from the train to the jet. I, I think I think it's on the moon at this point. But my my point is, I know you don't want to go too big picture, but like it's it the big picture and the small picture like tie in perfectly together when you beat a ranked team fifty six to seven and. Well, won't be right no, they will not be right tomorrow. <laughs> Unless they, if they are, then it will be a tremendous show of respect to Indiana. Uh, I mean, there's just like there's nothing. Like how many penalties? Indiana had four penalties. I guess that wasn't great. I don't know. Like you know, I, I, it's, I mean, it's like you said, Curtis is like we did have the one drop. Like it was you know and the interception they had that Curtis Rourke that didn't, Yeah, that doesn't count. Like, like that's I mean, you know that's that's. Well, not, let's talk about not Rourke's problem. injury. Uh, yeah, because um, that is, I think, the shadow. It's a thumb. It looks very much like it's a thumb. Whether it's is it just a nail? Is it something structural within the thumb? Yeah, and we saw him after the game. Uh, there's video up on my Twitter feed of him walking, and they were purposely having him. Um, uh, <laughs> um, keep his hand in his pocket so people can see it. Um, and so uh, Kurt Signetti had told a sideline reporter at the half. Like he was, Kevin Costner in yeah, Field of Dreams. It's he not was, a gun, it's your finger. He was fine. And after the game, he kind of said, we'll know more tomorrow. But he, but he said, but he said, but yeah, like uh, uh, he said, but optimistic. But optimistic. So um, there's that. Um, do you rush it back? 
What's you know? I, I, that's the kind of the. the I think the question, right? honestly, the question is just like what the long term reaggravation concern is. Because yeah. if there isn't a big one, if it's just follow up question, I basically had... what it looked like he was struggling with was gripping the football. Yeah. Because he threw, I think, four passes in total after the injury. There was the one really good looking one that was broken up by by good Nebraska coverage. He had he had like two, and then the hail mary where I recognize the pass itself didn't matter and nobody cares, but like sure. he, he threw it very short for how long we know he can air the ball out. So the question is basically, cause you, you can't give him, I assume like a pain killing injection because he's got to have feeling in the thumb to be able to grip the ball. Well, my question was so, that I would have asked as a follow-up was if the game was anywhere close, cause they felt comfortable leaving him in like what yeah, happened at yeah. that time and would it would have mattered. Like would they have tried it? Like, but he didn't even come out. He didn't come. He out, never so. came out in uniform after halftime. Um, so yeah. like it was clearly a decision made at halftime to say twenty eight to seven, we're going to Taven. And you know, I, I cursed that he had some some nice things to say about Taven Jackson. He said he's still got to get better. He's got to be more consistent in practice. But then he also said, but listen, like it's hard to get better sometimes as a backup quarterback, especially at this time of year, because you're not getting a ton of reps. Yeah, very, your first string quarterback is yeah, the one getting all the repetitions. He's the one that's getting all the new stuff installed for him. He's the one that is everything's kind of building and coalescing around. He it's hard to anything. you can't judge. I think what he's trying to say is you can't judge a backup quarterback by the standards of a starting quarterback in season because a starting quarterback just has advantages. Yeah, because he's saying they install development. The Taven doesn't even get to practice. Right, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so that's why I think you are encouraged by the way that he played, frankly. And they, you know, they called a couple of plays that were easy for him, but man, like he looked poised. Like he didn't look rattled. He was going through his progressions well. When it was quick stuff, when it was like like the the touchdown pass he threw to Miles Cross, that was just like the the easy play action fake. But it was like even that. It was sounds smooth. everything was smooth. Yeah, I mean, like even th here. even throws like that can be difficult sometimes because they seem easy. But you can't you can't put it behind a player in that situation because it's so lateral. It'll slow him down. You can't put it too far ahead, or obviously he'll drop it. Or in some cases, you risk an interception. But I do think I mean it, it'll just be the question of the week in terms of it like, will. Well, it'll dominate the storylines. And and Signetti only talks on Mondays, um, and so you know well, it's the coach's show. Uh, yeah, I'm but sure it, it'll come up there, but we'll see. We'll see. I mean, uh, he, I I don't think he would come out and say in the same way that he did with Jalen Walker after Northwestern. And Walker was obviously fine. He played all day today. Yeah, I thought there would be more subterfuge, and he's just like he's fine. He's gonna play. And yeah, I'm like, like well, it, how much is he gonna play? Gonna, I don't think he would say I'm optimistic if yeah. if if he wasn't genuinely optimistic. It's not a broken wrist. It doesn't and because there's no because there's no reason there's no reason to be like oh I'm really optimistic. Oops. Yeah. <laughs> I was optimistic, and I, I am now no longer. Um, how did we like Jack Tuttle? Well, I, I don't know how Jack Tuttle's still in, in college, Greg Kelly. Um, Mark, so so this is a, a long-time listener. M the question I have is, is it's MRK, HSS. Mm -hmm. we, if we assume it's Mark, mm -hmm. what do we think the vowel in the last name is? Hey. Mark, Mark Haas? Yeah. Okay. All right. So Mark Haas, he says, is there a historical... Big Ten comparison to IU's turnaround. Are we looking more at? Are we looking more like a 1999 Rams or 2015 Leicester City situation? I know you don't know what 2015 Leicester City is. Leicester City was 25,000 to one to win the Premier League in 2016, and they did it. Um, I mean, I think we like. I actually think those are in their own ways both very good comparisons. Um, that 99 Rams team did kind of come out of nowhere. Um, and obviously part of it was because they built that team for Trent Green and Trent Green was a good NFL quarterback, but, but then he got replaced by a guy who turned out to be a Hall of Famer. And so that just kind of changed the whole calculus. I mean, there is a bit of a Leicester City comparison there too, though, where like, I mean, I think Indiana was, I think I saw this because I get, the, I get the emails from a couple of different sports books, you know, like, oh, look at the Heisman odds this week and whatever. And at the beginning of the season, they'll send you odds on, you know, basically everything you could imagine. And I think Indiana was something like plus twenty thousand to make the playoff, which meant if you bet a dollar, you won twenty thousand dollars. So um, at least I think that's what that means. Somebody, I, I don't gamble enough to really understand odds, but uh, which is <laughs> just in Vegas. It's like, well, in that case, we would love it if you. We have a. Uh, we can comp your room, Mr. Osterman. Just yeah. just come down here. But the point is, the Leicester City comparison is Hess. There we go. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, Mike is, is more sorry than I am, but, um, the Leicester city comparison fits in the sense that like, nobody would have seen this coming. Now, listen, the flip side is, yeah, you know, Kurt but the flip side is they got to, you know, they're still five games away. Um, but listen, 
I mean, you have to talk about this team as a playoff contender. There's there's just no way around it. And yes, there are probably going to be teams in the Big Ten, Penn State's an example, that will play tougher schedules overall. But if you win 11 games in the Big Ten, you are going to the playoff. Like you just, there's there's no well, look, way you're not. I mean, gonna, like like, the, I mean it, it's, you know, when you look at the back half of the schedule, there's reasons not to be so fearful. Uh, you know, outside of Ohio State, I mean, Michigan's quarterback situation is one of the worst in the country. Yeah. I mean, that was supposed to be their second. You start time. talking about more of these games as trap games, frankly. Like, if game day's in town next week, you talk about Washington more yeah. like a trap game. Yeah. You, you talk about Michigan State, and it's like, well, you're probably a better team than Michigan State, but it's on the road, and it's tough to play there. And it's, yeah, like, it's, I mean, like, it, you know, it, it, it's like it, you get. I know Kirsty Nagy talks about complacency, but listen, we're not on his team. Like, we don't, we don't, we don't have to abide by this, this rule that we're never allowed to talk about any of this like it's never happened or, or whatever um i mean you are allowed to start talking about some of these games and just saying i mean indiana's gonna be favored against washington they're probably gonna be favored against michigan state probably the, the, i mean out of your mind if they're not gonna be they're gonna be favored by a touchdown i would be very surprised at this point if they're not favored against michigan i would love to know the last time that happened other than the covid season they're gonna be favored against michigan. i would love to know what <clears throat> if someone is out there that makes odds i would love to know what IU at Ohio State would open at tomorrow. If that was if that was out there, I would love to know. Would it be within a touchdown? You think like that close? I mean, how do you? I mean, yeah. at this point, like, I mean, I mean, like, it, it just it's it is the way Indiana the, is I mean, winning. If it's games. not, it's the reputation. Well, look here. Here's a here's a perfect. We talked about this. I talked to Tevin Cole, Coleman briefly. Uh, former IU running back, and I asked him, but no, I asked him, no, no, what no, the I, perception yeah. of the team was when he came. Mm -hmm. Like they thought we were trash. Yeah, I mean, and that's what I think is built into why people wouldn't take uh, Indiana seriously. I think, I think that's why some people it's even Indiana. wanted to see this more as a reflection of Nebraska than Versus Indiana. Indiana. So Whereas, think, like, I'm sorry, I, this is about Indiana. Th like, that's literally what it is. Is that that sting? And Urban Meyer talked about. It. He's like, why? I mean, like Bill Murray, they're winning his coach, and he's like, average five wins a year. I mean, yeah. Like, look, this is not. A um, program that's become account, uh, you know, accustomed to uh, success in any way, shape, or form. So I think that reputation. Uh, look, you're not going to be able to beat that in one season. Kurt Singer used to talk about that, um, but he doesn't also but care. Man, he's, I mean, he's he doesn't doing, care. He's, he's trying his he's best. He's trying his best. best. Like it's, he's trying his best. You're only a couple more wins away from talking about like how not even a playoff game, game, but like a playoff buy. <laughs> <laughs> and like I like it's just like it's 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 we're wild. Going, we're going to the college. And I did. T Justin Allison did was the first player I heard use the word playoff. You know, the first player that used it. I said. In fairness, Mikel Kamara has said natty a couple times. So what? Used it as slang. But like I don't know. I, you could yeah, be saying something completely. He might be drinking a, a natty light. So maybe that's what he's talking. I about. don't think that was the case. But um, but he said it, and I laughed. I was like, isn't that illegal? Like, is there a demerit system? Do you feel like Kurt Signay's like no looking? He said. <laughs> no, no he said problem. today, which was not as catchy of a phrase. Tomorrow is a concept. I don't think it has yeah. the same ring as Google. Made. No, no, I don't know if that'll catch on. Too many doubles. But <laughs> tomorrow is a concept. So, but the point is, the way this team is winning games, like I mean, for example, you would have said, "What is the biggest like sort of single thing Indiana can't afford to lose?" It would have been Curtis Work, and I understand they were up twenty-eight-seven, but the fact that they lose the like, if, if you said, "Who's the one player you can't pull out of this?" Because we talked about they've developed more depth than we thought at defensive line, and and their skill positions. And, you know, that the, they've stayed relatively healthy on the offensive line and all this other than Nick Kidwell's injury, obviously. If you said, like, what's the one thing more than anything else that could derail Indiana at this point in terms of what might happen on the field, it would be losing Curtis Rourke and, and all the praise that he's gotten. And I understand you're up 28 to 7, but you out actually come out and perform other, other than – Total yards, but in terms of points, you perform better in the second well, half. Your field position was so good, you couldn't. Even I understand it. that, but, but like they couldn't even do that. Well, and here's here's team. something one of my buddies who covered Nebraska told me: at the end of the first half, Indiana was on pace to gain more yards than any team had ever gained on Nebraska ever. That makes sense. Like were, in in six hundred fifty something six six. Yeah, I mean, um, but but like it's it's just. The fact that you can even lose the player that I think the average I mean, fan I mean, or observer would identify as the most important, least replaceable player I mean, and actually get better on the scoreboard, that tells you that, again, it's just it's a really well-coached team that is going to be hard to stop. Somebody's going to beat it somewhere, I assume. But I would reframe it and say it's like if they lose work, they still probably win 10 games. Yeah. You know, I, think it lowers your, I think it lowers your ceiling a little bit just because I think – 
he was playing phenomenal. They went out before. He uh, was. I mean, so, he, he. I mean, like. But then that throw from Taven Jackson. Oh, but I still, but I mean, it's going to be longer. It's a small sample size. And yeah, be, sure. It's gonna be more competitive environments, but um, it, you know, I just think it lowers their ceiling a little bit. But I still think they're actually a pretty good team, even with the backup quarterback. And I don't know if you would. I mean, that's just like this is a well-oiled machine at this point. It's not one guy. It's not one position group. It's not. The offense, like the defense, I mean, we'll look, we'll, we're going to keep talking about the offense, you know, for the next the rest of the season because it's just been so good. But the defense is right there. Well, I mean, the defense, like, I think the, the relevant thing about the defense to me is if, if people had, again, these, five these sort of, well, if, if people had, again, these sorts of doubts about, you know, what might slow Indiana down, what might be an obstacle for Indiana. One of the things people justifiably pointed out is that Nebraska and Northwestern, the defense regressed a little bit, but compared to what it was doing to some of its non-conference opponents, mean which, or, yeah, sorry, uh, yeah, or Maryland and Northwestern, sorry. The, the defense, if you looked at the, whether it was the raw numbers, the underlying numbers, the analytics and things, the offense was just like crazy outperforming all expectations, everybody else in the conference, whatever. The defense had kind of come back to earth a little bit from some of the dominant performances against bad teams in non-conference play. I mean, today, 70 yards rushing allowed, 304 total yards allowed. What, was it three sacks in the end, I think? And then you said five turnovers forced? Two, two sacks. Two, oh, is it still only two and five turnovers forced? Like, if if, th if that was supposed to be – If that was supposed, supposed to be the weak there. point, if that was supposed to be the weak – It's like, I don't – I mean, I have covered – I mean, I, just to be brutally honest, a lot of bad – football like i have and i'm not picking on anybody i'm not calling anybody out coaches players whatever but a lot of you have been around it with me i you were here for it last year i have covered plenty of ugly football this is poetry and motion. so far at the other end of the scale it's the best looking i've mean, covered you know i've covered some decent offensive uh, teams uh, um, offer uh, Auburn teams that had a good offense, and some really on the opposite of that, like horrible teams. But this is the best offense I've ever seen. And again, like I bring this up a lot, but it's not because it's not because they just have some freak athletes that can just beat everybody down the field, or There's nothing, to, or, 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 or yeah, like they have a Derrick Henry like running back that just can't. Like it just it is so well schemed. It's not like when you yeah it's when so you get well a executed. generational player and that just lifts your off. Like yeah, complete. It's the complete anti current era of college football where it's just like they built this sort of special team and group of players. And and scheme has a lot to do with it, and coaching has a lot to do with it. And it's just here we are. Here we are. We'll leave it there for now. We'll be back in week. We swear we'll podcast this week. Things things came up. We just couldn't make it work last week, but we promise we'll podcast this week. Uh, will we be talking? All right. Official prediction. Will we be talking about ESP? By the time you listen to this, you probably already know if you aren't watching right now. Will Indiana be hosting Game Day next week? I'm gonna do it now. You gotta do it. Right? I think I think the answer is yes. I think you gotta go ahead and do it. Because Michigan's gonna get, if the Michigan loses today, I don't think you can wait for Michigan. I think you do it now. Mm -hmm. And then maybe because you can always do Ohio State anyway. Yeah, you might see yeah, you, you might see you might see him again at Ohio State. I, and I, the Big Ten championship. I mean, they could do game day three times. I don't I don't know. I like I, I genuinely hand to God, I don't know that game day is coming, but I would predict. If you're asking me, is game day gonna be here next week or not? I would say I think it is more likely than not they will be here. There we go. We'll leave it there. He's Mike Nisak. I'm Zach Osterman for the Louisiana Herald Times for the Indianapolis Star. See Zach at Shalubis tonight. I imagine you're making that. I'm, I'm, doing, uh, I'm doing some karaoke. Signing up for this. Peaceful World by John Mellingham uh, 11 times in a row. And then I'm going home. Uh, thank you so much for watching uh, Eat at Shalubis. We'll talk to you soon.